Hi all, this is Shetan. Uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, so in this lecture, we are going to talk about um, AWS uh, basic services. Uh, so if you are not familiar with AWS uh, and uh, you don't know much about AWS services, this lecture is for you. Okay, so uh, before starting this uh, lecture, I want you to understand few things about AWS. First is AWS global data centers. So whenever we are, we will be using uh, some AWS services, typically we will deploy it in uh, some AWS uh, uh, geographical area. Now that geographic area is called AWS regions. Like in uh, across the world, there are different AWS regions available for us. Like in US, there are seven regions. In India, there is one region. In Europe, there are a couple of regions. regions. And uh, in all there are 20 regions at the moment uh, till date and five more regions coming soon in 2019 and when you deploy services we can choose which regions uh, we need to deploy in uh, now every region further is comprised of uh, typically two or more data centers that's for high availability of AWS services and those data centers are called availability zones. We will uh, learn more about it shortly. Also, uh, as in AWS global data centers, there are something called age locations. Now, age locations are something like uh, you can consider it like an caching, uh, caching devices which are there across uh, 100 plus cities across the world and uh, your content like your media, uh, videos and pictures what you watch maybe on the Facebook or uh, YouTube they get cached uh, to the nearest uh, location and from there it is delivered to the user so it basically improves the uh, performance by lowering the latency network latency right so overall AWS has 130 plus services uh, if you heard about EC2 S3 these are like different AWS services and we are going to learn more about these services in this lecture. Okay, so as I said, uh, region is one geographic area. Here the blue area you see is an AWS region and every region uh, consists of typically two or more availability zones for high availability of your application. So when you design your architecture, typically you will keep your uh, machines in different AZs so that if one of the AZ goes down for some reason you have your machine running in another AZ and your application then have high availability. Okay, so we'll talk about more this in EC2 sessions uh, which is a different course but as of now you just need to know about these things. Okay, I hope uh, the region and availability zone uh, you are familiar with now. I hope uh, the region and availability zone uh, you are familiar with now. <clears throat> Let's move ahead and now I want to talk about AWS services. So uh, before that, just a quick uh, overview of how these services, regions and AZ really map to each other so first thing if you have an AWS account AWS account is a top level entity that means once you have an AWS account you can deploy your infrastructure in any of the AWS region uh, so as I said there are 20 regions as of now and every region then further comprise of two or more AZs that is what's shown here now in AWS there are different services and they have different scope with respect to region or AZs or account level. For example, uh, say billing service, it works at an account level. That means at the end of the month, you get one AWS bill, which you have to pay. IAM, which is identity and access management, it also works at account level, which means uh, how many users you want to create, you can create that and all these users would have access to all AWS regions and AZs and the services because they work globally, right? And there are more services we'll talk about shortly. And then some other services like S3, DynamoDB, they work at region level. That means when you create S3 bucket, you select in which region you want to create that S3 bucket, right? Similarly, DynamoDB tables. So, um, and then there are further uh, services like EC2, which is an VM, RDS databases, elastic block storage, like a disk, 
all this works at AZ level. The scope of these services is AZ level. That means one EC2 instance cannot be in two AZs at the same time. It would be either in AZ1 or AZ2 or AZ3 depending on where we are launching that machine. Same with the databases and the disk. So we will see more services but from this I want you to understand different AWS services works at different level and this is a scope where AWS account is a top level entity under which we have AWS regions and then we have AZs in given AWS region. Now let's move to AWS services. Now there are so many AWS services as I said there are 130 plus AWS services and we can broadly categorize them into different uh, uh, kind of computing power or analytic services like this. So in compute there are EC2 auto scaling, Lambda, load balancers, container service. Likewise for data analytics there is say EMR which is Hadoop service, Kinesis, Athena. So rather than talking about uh, these services now in this uh, fashion I would like to take some example and then uh, so that you can map really how this service fits into some architecture and that probably would help you uh, recall what service is used for what. Okay. Similarly, there are other categories like storage services and databases services. Then there are some network related services and management services. Further, you have application services and development services as well. So still it does not really uh, uh, take care of all AWS services, but we have uh, listed uh, the widely used AWS services, the popular AWS services. Okay. With this, uh, what uh, I want to do next is uh, I want to build one application uh, and we will see how to uh, create the same architecture using AWS services. So what we want to do is now uh, to understand different AWS services where they fit into any architecture. We want to build a simple social media application, maybe a mini version of uh, Facebook or an Instagram. And then we'll see how to design the same architecture using different AWS services. Okay. Uh, so uh, our application is uh, fb.com. For example, we our users will access it using this name. So first thing, if you want to uh, deploy this application uh, in your on-premise data centers, then the first thing you will need is one private network. Like every company has their private network, we would also require something like this uh, to make it secure, of course. Uh, the next thing you would require is a web servers. Now, uh, to start with, suppose we are a startup, then we'll probably build a small code in maybe PHP and uh, we will run in some kind of application server or a web server and uh, it should work maybe for at least 100 users or lower than that. And it works fine and our users will access this application uh, using IP address initially. So maybe this VM has some public IP and users access it. Now, what happens over the time? is like uh, you you uh, want to now extend your application and uh, you want to add some business logic, uh, some UI th stuff, uh, the login functionality and more. So that's where you need to then have a web server as well as application server so that all the front end stuff is uh, taken care of by web server but all business logic, uh, suppose it's a Facebook kind of application then um, Maybe the, uh, you connect with different people. Uh, so uh, adding that data and everything is taken care by application server. And of course, uh, further, if you want to extend it, you need some kind of database like a relational database, MySQL or an um, uh, even you can have oracles, whatever you prefer. Right. So if you have this kind of application, it works well. It's it's called three tier architecture and your users are using this application using an IP address. Right. So this works well and considering uh, the app is really doing good, your website is really uh, doing good and uh, there is more traction from the users and somewhere then your web servers or an application servers become, becomes a bottleneck. Maybe they are not able to handle the increased load on your applications. So what's the solution? Typically you will scale. Now that scaling can happen vertical scaling. That means you increase the capacity of these machines or it could you could do horizontal scaling. So 
typically uh, in three tier architecture you will see web servers and application servers are scaled horizontally that means you bring more web servers and more application servers uh, right like i have shown here okay that's fine now i have multiple web servers and multiple application servers but as you know there are multiple web servers. that means there are multiple ip addresses and now is the time where we need an uh, intelligent entity who can really distribute load to these web servers and that's where we bring in the load balancer service so if you heard about uh, load balancers uh, like HA proxy and nginx they do something like this uh, a user hits the request to the load balancer then and then evenly distribute that to a backend uh, uh, servers like this and as you know now we have load balancers also and uh, your application is really catching up typically you don't want your application to be accessed using ip address you want people to access your application with the domain name something called say fb.com and that's where uh, you need some dns service where you can map your dns uh, this domain name to load balancer ip address probably right okay so so far so good this works fine right uh, your application is three tier and it is working well now it catches up further and you are now having a lot of data uh, say your number of friends are growing number of connections are growing uh, number of posts are growing and that's where your relational database cannot really serve this kind of uh, 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 maybe data storing data you cannot do that in relational databases for this you need a scalable databases and also uh for connection information and all it makes sense to rather uh, going for no sql databases so what you will do bring in the no sql database uh, like mongodb or cassandra uh, anything that you want to have so some part of data is stored in relational databases and other is stored in non-relational or no sql databases but still your relational databases could be a performance bottleneck maybe there is a very uh, read heavy operations happening on this database and for that typically you will bring in one more component which is called database caches okay so you bring in some database cache engines like redis or memcached where you can query the uh frequently uh, access data so that uh, your application servers don't hit the database but all the requests are served from this uh, cache engine okay so this is fairly better architecture what we saw where we started with now next thing as you know facebook might be getting millions of pictures uploaded daily and the videos daily now this disk which are attached to the vm are not really capable of extending on the fly they have uh, size limitations and that's where all these media pictures are never stored typically on these web servers or an application servers for you need for this you need some unlimited kind of storage and that's an external storage and it could be it, it should not be necessarily a block storage like uh, your disk it, it can be a file storage like a shared file system or something or some external storage like google drive if you are aware of right so you need some external storage where you store this information okay so that makes your storage uh, that solves your storage uh, capacity problem if you use external storage that's fine so far so good now next what happens is when you upload a videos or photos you need some kind of content filters like maybe uh, you are uploading videos and that video has some uh, some content which are objectable or there are some pictures we ha which has some nudity so you need some uh, content filter which can do this on the fly and then those pictures videos should be actually stored here in the external storage so we bring in one more component there right okay that's fine now you also know uh facebook uh, also throws a lot of ads and it is continuously watching what activities you are doing on uh, while you are on the facebook page uh, maybe what kind of products you are liking uh, what kind of posts you are liking and based on that it gives you suggestions and the friend request uh, will throw a lot of ads uh, right so this is called click stream analysis every click is getting captured somewhere and it is getting analyzed uh, in real time so you need some kind of click stream analysis engine there 
right uh, let's take an example twitter uh, what all tweets are going on in the market what's the mood of the people currently all this is done using the clickstream analysis so on facebook also you have something like this now all this data what this clickstream analysis engine captures it has to further store somewhere in the external storage right and you need an external storage for this like this storage for storing this data and further you want to take this data and do some data operations like you need to run some uh, uh, maybe aggregations you need to sort your data and you need to find some meaning out of that data and that's where you need some kind of uh, Hadoop platform uh, which can perform the computing on distributed systems right so you need some kind of Hadoop platform and you would also require over the time one data warehousing uh, why because maybe at the end of the year or uh, facebook does a lot of uh, data analytics right maybe at the end of the year they want to find out uh, which kind of users are accessing facebook more what are their age limit uh, what are their age uh, in which uh, region they come from uh, how particular feature of Facebook did so that they can concentrate more on those kind of features what is trending all this information is uh, taken out by storing this information in some kind of data warehousing engine and then doing some kind of business intelligence on top of it so you need some business intelligence tool which can uh, query this data analyze this data and then there are reports generated out of which then Facebook can take decisions like next year maybe this is our strategy uh, we will focus on this area or that area so some business decision you can drive based on what uh, analytics results come out of this okay so this all about this is more on a back-end size uh, which uh, end user does not really know but this is happening there okay so far so good so we have extended our architecture now next what we have is all these photos and videos they can be directly served over the internet because you consider this as like a google drive so you can directly maybe stream your videos and watch and pictures directly from this storage so users might come from the web browser and they may watch uh, whatever post uh, suppose you have posted a video so they can watch that video here but sometimes uh, your users come from using mobile devices nowadays they will watch your videos through mobile and in that case you need the same videos but in probably different format that's because mobile device might play uh, a different format of the video and for this typically we will need some kind of video converter in between so whenever any user uploads some videos uh, maybe they should be immediately converted into a mobile friendly format all right so you need some kind of uh, computing power here as well okay so we will introduce that as a uh, video converter here next uh, all these photos and videos are typically served from as I said from the external storage but uh, you know whenever some video get viral right millions of users watch that video now every time if that video is fetched from this location this will this might become a bottleneck or you may pay a price because your data is flowing out to the internet and there are a lot of usage of your videos so for to solve this problem you need to have something called cdn content delivery network which is nothing but which caches these videos and pictures to the nearest caching devices from where the user is accessing your videos right so that all the uh, users in that geography when they want to watch the same video it is served from here it is not really served from here so user experience the low latency and better experience so in uh, uh, applications like uh, Instagram and Facebook or in YouTube uh, largely uh, they would have a lot of content delivery networks through which uh, the contents are served okay so so far so good uh, we have extended architecture further now you know uh, uh, Facebook also sends you a mobile notifications right there is a new friend request or there is a likes on your post now for this we need uh, and uh, some kind of notification service right maybe you get an SMS or uh, mobile push notifications so you need that service also it sends you emails right uh, for various activities you can disable that but yeah there is uh, options to opt for email service as well 
right and uh, further you can also chat with your friends and for this typically a queue is used you know messaging queue if you heard about like rabbit mq jms queues um, ibm mq these are all queue services which enables the kind of first in first out and that kind of data structure so for chatting maybe you require some kind of queue service as well okay so if we consider all these services it's a bare minimum kind of social media application uh, i'm sure there must be much many more components but we are just sticking to this as of now and finally if you want to uh, deploy this architecture and monitor it continuously like, like how my vms are doing how my databases are doing how my storage is doing how much storage is there all this you need some kind of monitoring service and a dashboards like production dashboard where you can monitor health of your application okay so overall this will be your architecture and uh, uh, this probably we deployed on uh, on premises and now let's see if you want to do the same thing on AWS then how we will do this we want to do this now on AWS so let's see first thing this private network what you see here in AWS world it is called VPC virtual private cloud so it is not exactly the way it is shown here because all some of the services are outside VPC but I cannot accommodate that in a diagram but consider VPC as one private isolated network that AWS gives you and then you would have to manage all the public uh, network for web servers and load balancer and a private network for databases that is a separate part of discussion but the VPC is a network service now all these VMs that we are talking about these are nothing but EC2 machines right and the disk that we attach it's called EBS elastic block storage and they have limitation of maximum size so EC2 and EBS solves your problem of the VMs that uh, typically will deploy your applications on whether web servers or app servers now further you can have an auto scaling enabled for EC2s that means if the load increases on this EC2 they can scale horizontally automatically and if the load decreases they can scale down maybe from two machines they can go to 10 machines from 10 they can come back to two machines depending on the load that you can configure using auto scaling feature of AWS EC2 further for databases relational databases there is a service called RDS and for NoSQL databases, there is a service called DynamoDB. For DB caches, there is a service called Elastic Cache Service. And it comes with a Redis and Memcached engines in that. Okay. Further, uh, as you see, there is a load balancer. So in Amazon, there is a service called ELB, Elastic Load Balancer Service, which can, dist which can distribute the incoming traffic to multiple backend EC2 machines like this and further if you want to have your domain name mapping to your load balancer then you need a DNS service which is called route 53 okay great now uh, let's talk about the other uh, stuff that we have like for external storage it is an s3 service of Amazon simple storage service right which take which is unlimited storage you can just go on dumping the data and it is accessible over the internet directly and there is no size limitation how much data you can store in your s3 buckets also you need some content filter so there is a service called recognition which can uh, find out an objectable images and it can filter it out before you upload it to the say s3 buckets okay now as I said you need some kind of service where your videos from one format get converted to another format like mp4 to some mobile friendly format now for this one uh, option is you run some EC2 machines which continuously watch your S3 buckets for new videos as the new video comes they download it here convert it and put it back into another bucket that's one option but there is a better option for this like a lambda service now lambda is a serverless service of Amazon where you just write a code in that code you specify how to maybe convert a video and you can execute this lambda function whenever there is a new upload happening into your s3 so new video comes lambda gets triggered <coughs> it will convert your video and maybe you have put in logic that uh, put that video into another s3 bucket so now here there are no servers to manage everything is taken care by lambda functions and they scale automatically 
okay so we got lambda there now let's talk about this clickstream analysis now for clickstream analysis there is a service called kinesis which can capture your clickstream data and then you can analyze that data you can even further store that data in s3 and you can do much more with whatever data you capture right now for the spark or hadoop platform there is a service called emr and for emr does like uh, operations like uh, aggregation sorting and you can run distributed jobs uh, spark jobs filling jobs all this you can run in this managed hadoop cluster and you also need to do etl transactions from your dynamo db tables like maybe you want to do what all friends are there uh, friends friend what activities they are doing they, you want to continuously uh, push new post on your wall now all this is done in real time using clickstream analysis and uh, at the end of the year maybe you want all this data uh, to be extracted converted into different format data cataloging and then further do some data processing using emr so you need this glue service for doing this extract transfer transform and load operations etl operations right and then finally all this data what you uh, process or what data you have you can store it in the uh, data warehouse service which is nothing but redshift in amazon so redshift is a data warehousing service which can store petabyte scale of data and they can you can perform the analysis on the data and to perform this analysis and uh, see the results you need some bi tools which uh, like uh, there are various uh, bi tools in the market but in amazon you will use amazon quicksight or you can also use athena which is an sql query interface so you can pull data from s3 perform uh, maybe an sql operation on that and all those results can be viewed in a quick sight uh, you build some graphs some charts and you get insights of your data based on that you will take some business decisions so it's a um, bi service uh, uh, from amazon okay so far so good uh, we introduced a lot of aws services here now let's move to this side now as i said uh, there is a content delivery network which can cache your static content and for this in amazon there is something called cloudfront service and cloudfront stores or caches your data in edge locations like i said their edge locations are there in across cities across uh, 100 plus cities across the world and uh, when you use cloudfront service all your data from s3 or wherever you uh, store your data it gets it get cached in the nearest edge location from where the user is coming and the data is always served from that edge location for the all the users in that geography okay so that's a cloudfront service now let's talk about uh, this side uh, so as i said you need to send then messages and mobile push notification in amazon there is a service called sns simple notification service for that and if you want to send emails a bulk email then there is an ses service simple email service now for messaging queues for chatting application amazon has built its own queue service which is called sqs simple queue service and finally to monitor all this infrastructure how my ec2s are doing what's the cpu utilization of ec2s how is uh, database is doing all this can be monitored in real time using a service called cloudwatch even you can set alarms like if an average cpu utilization goes beyond say this percent send an email or alert to administrator or take some action do some auto scaling here all this can be done using this cloudwatch alarm there okay so i think uh, we have completely replaced uh, what we did on premises with all with aws services and i hope uh, you got some idea about all these basic aws services okay next we want to see some more aws services and let's see some application services now as you know uh, it's a facebook or twitter or any other uh, web services or even amazon itself it exposes all their services through api calls so that different 
third party application can integrate with these applications and for that they need a REST API service where they can expose all their APIs. So in Amazon you can have managed API uh, gateways where it takes care of scaling, throttling, everything. So you just write a code for your APIs, uh, uh, definitions of your APIs and API gateway, it can be deployed in API gateway. Also, uh, as the mobile usage is increasing, most of your users, the web users, you need to manage their identities. Like when you develop an application, you must sign up, your users must sign up to your uh, application, right? And that means you need to manage your user pools, their accesses and everything. And for that, uh, you need some user management service. So in AWS, that service is called Cognito. Right. So these are more application services that we can use here. Now let's move ahead and talk about the security services in this architecture. Now, as you know, uh, there is one primary service for managing all accesses in your AWS, like all your AWS users, uh, what access they have, what services they can use. Even when say one AWS service like EC2 wants to upload a data to S3, then EC2 needs permissions to do that. Now all these accesses and author authentication and authorization is managed using Amazon's IAM service, Identity and Access Management. It's one of the most important service for securing your AWS account as well as uh, services. Next, what you can also do is you can encrypt your data, which is there, which is stored at various uh, 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 storage locations like EBS is a block storage like a disk attached to the EC2 you can encrypt that data data which is stored in S3 which is stored in EMR Redshift queue messages databases caches all this data you can encrypt using Amazon's KMS key management service so it manages all the encryptions key for you you don't need to have your own uh, secure uh, location where you can store your keys and do the encryptions further as you know uh, this application will be accessed probably over HTTPS uh, which is SSL enabled uh, connection because uh, obviously if uh, users are doing some transactions or uh, they don't want to lose their uh, important information you would secure that communication and for this you need a uh, digital certificates uh, right so that you either deploy it on load balancers or you may deploy it on cloud front so that your communication is secure for this Amazon has a service called ACM Amazon certificate manager okay next as you know we can also uh, have the application firewalls now those application firewalls are called WAF web application firewall now that take cares of uh, any attacks uh, it can prevent uh, like uh, cross-site scripting SQL injections even the DDoS attacks which are happening WAF can protect your application from these attacks and you will typically deploy it on CloudFront or in WAF or sorry on load balancers or in front of your API gateways that we saw in earlier side so that uh, you are safe and other uh, various ways is to secure VPC, the public and private that we'll see in a detailed VPC session, the networking in AWS uh, lectures. But here we are talking about application level uh, firewalls. So that's WAF. And if you're uh, these machines, uh, if you are going for some kind of compliance, for example, uh, PCI DSS compliance or say you're going for an HIPAA compliance. So your machines need to be uh, patched properly they should be free from vulnerabilities right or CVE as you know and for that there is a service called AWS inspector what it does it puts an agent inside your machines and it scans your machine for any known vulnerabilities and then it will give you report saying like you know all these machines out of these machines we found these vulnerabilities go and fix those so inspector can give insights about uh, what's there inside our machines Okay, so these are primarily used uh, security services. There are more, but I think we'll restrict our discussions to only these services as of now. Next, we want to see some development and DevOps services. Now, as you see this architecture, it has a lot of AWS services and all are connected. 
so when you want to deploy everything by hand maybe manually i i would say it will take maybe a couple of days to do this uh without making any errors or or detecting the errors and fixing it all this has to be done manually then it will take two or three days probably but with aws it gives you ability to code your infrastructure that's called infrastructure as a code so you can have a service like cloud formation what it does it takes kind of a template from from you which is in json or yaml format and it will just create this infrastructure from scratch for you and that too within maybe 30 minutes depending on what size you have but typically i have seen like 30 30 minutes maximum it will create all these resources for you it's a very powerful service which can provision your infrastructure from the scratch right and now uh, this cloud formation template will be written by some devops people and at the same time you would have your developers and a qa who developers are writing code for your product and maybe qas are uh, writing a qa test cases automation test cases now everybody need some kind of code repository like a git code repository for that aws has a code commit service where they can check in the code so f even this cloud formation template is nothing but a json or a yaml code so these guys your devops guys will write that as a template cloud formation service will take that template and create this infrastructure now once you have this in infrastructure up you require your uh, actually product to be built and uh, for that you need code build service so amazon code build will take the source code uh, which your language you have written in java or whatever and it will build that using some kind of build tool like ant or maven and it produces uh, also while building it will do some unit test and finally it will produce some artifacts now artifacts are like your exes or a binaries actually your application uh, executables basically so the code build will do that will test it and then you have to deploy this that means whatever it produces you have to put these exes and binaries in ec2 machines where your applications is actually running so you will require a deployment and for this you have a code deploy service All right so uh, if you know about the devops you heard about the term ci and the cds so this is your ci pipelines continuous integration pipeline or a continuous delivery pipeline you can say and if you want to have this automated like you know developers are writing the code checking in in it automatically gets built it automatically tested and automatically deployed into uh, corresponding application servers running in ec2 then you can have a code pipeline service right so you can completely build your ci uh, ci platform here using this three and uh, code pipeline service now if you want to further integrate all these things with uh, project management tools like maybe a jira uh, some bug tracking tool how your uh, uh, how your what's the speed of your development and all the management tools now it is called a code star service which very well integrates with uh, atlassian jira and other tools so you have complete sdlc control now if you use these of these development and the devops services okay so i think uh, uh, this is clear now uh, where these uh, development and deployment services are used okay so if you have come up to this uh, you know about most of the aws core services now uh, for compute analytics storage uh, security uh, application and deployment services thank you